outro cast. Before I ask you about your excellent new album, which you're on brand for with the Nine Inch Nail shirt, can I ask you a Nerf Herder question? You sure can. Okay. Not a lot of people get immortalized in a Nerf Herder song. It's pretty much you, Courtney Love, Van Halen, just not a very, very long list. How long was it from finding out that there was going to be a song about you from Nerf Herder to it coming out? Did you Were you tipped off in advance? So I barely knew these guys, but I'm a huge fan of them. So personally, I did not really know them. I had opened for them once and we followed each other on Twitter. Um, and I loved interacting with them online, but I wouldn't say that we were like buds or anything. I would like to have. But uh, one day uh, they posted a um, track list from the new album that was going to come out. And one of the songs was called The Girl Who Listened to Rush. And I made a joke and I was like, is this about me? And they said, just wait. And then I got a direct message that says, hey, we have this new song coming out. Do you want to hear it? And I was like, yes, I do. And they didn't tell me what it was called. Um, they just sent me the track. And so I'm driving, listening to it. And I'm listening to the lyrics. And I'm like, OK, sounds like every Nerf Herder song I love. It's about a girl that the singers love. And this is great. Um, oh, they're mentioning glasses and the Simpsons and oh my god they just said my first and last name <laughs> and I almost got into a car accident because I was stunned um but they surprised me perfectly I had no idea that it was coming out until they sent it to me and I was blown away it felt like a weird practical joke it was the coolest thing ever so it's not like they said okay answer this questionnaire and we'll plug it <laughs> um, because Parry is actually very prolific if you look follow the YouTube stuff oh he's amazing but yeah, there, there are songs that are more biographical, usually have a lot of care that goes into it. But anyway, your album. Um, I know about the Kickstarter campaign and all that, but how long did it actually take to make it? Because very intricate stuff there with the string arrangements and the orchestration. Yeah, so from the very moment that I started it, and this includes like just kind of fussing around with demos and kind of figuring out what the sound would be to actually having it all mastered and ready to be released. Um, two years, which is crazy. Um, people hear Nine Inch Nails cover album, especially one that's called Peeled Back. We know that it's not going to be as intricate as what Trent Reznor does. You would probably think that's not going to take so long. <laughs> and you'd be wrong <laughs> because so much of the process was um, becoming a, a stronger um arranger and um just musician and and interpreter um so i was learning a lot as i went and we brought the strings who are incredible um john dinerstein and becky ward um we brought them in probably a year into the process and um it really elevates the album so much. And I got to work really closely with them. Um, sometimes John and Becky would fully come up with stuff. Sometimes I would have a stronger, you know, influence on, on some of the arrangements with them, which is really cool. They blew it out of the park. Yes. So kudos. And this is a compliment. This is not going to turn into a backhanded thing. Some <laughs> of your songs are very faithful to the chord structure. Then others you wrote a totally new composition <laughs> behind the song in a good way. Like the hand that feeds is pretty much like a new song in a good way. Oh, did thank you, you. Did you know outright, hey, I'm going to reinvent some of these? Because again, some of them are faithful covers and some of them are very original. Yeah, that was one of the things that was kind of great about taking so long is that the songs that are very different um, melodically, uh, didn't start that way. Most of the covers start really faithfully. And then after I kind of lay that down, I kind of experiment, well, how far can I push this where it's still in some way, at least in my ears, um, feels faithful, maybe not to the melody, but to the spirit of the song, to the emotion, to what connects to me about it. And Hand That Feeds um, is a departure um, melodically, but I do feel like I'm tapping into the things about the original that I like so much and kind of just amping that up. But it wasn't until I did my arrangement of Reptile, which is pretty much a new song, um, <laughs> that I was like, you know, 
if I'm not going big, what's the point? Let's let's just have a lot of fun with this one. I love Reptile, and I think that most of the women in my life that don't already love Nine Inch Nails might not love Reptile. How can I make them <laughs> get on board with this song? And maybe the answer is a slightly um, more welcoming melody. <laughs> Yeah, now the track listing is also interesting in that it's a mix of the big hits that you would expect and deep cuts. Was uh -huh. that a challenging thing for you to to pare down? Because it's not like Nine Inch Nails has two albums and one out of every two songs made the cut with this. Yeah, I actually wanted to avoid any big hits. I really didn't want to do Hurt. I didn't want to do, I wasn't even sure if I would do Closer. Um and Hand That Feeds was a later edition. Piggy was even a little later. Um, that being said, I thought if I could take these bigger songs and do something particularly original with them, I'll feel good about my ability to kind of put them on the album. But I'm a latecomer to Nine Inch Nails, so I didn't get into them until right before the project started. I got oh. into them two years ago or so. And they meant so much to me that I immediately got to work on this album. And so because I'm a new fan, but I already loved Trent Reznor's score, and I obviously am a huge music nerd, and I love the Beatles, which I think is very evident on this album, um, I'm able to kind of have this new approach that isn't kind of tethered to nostalgia. If mm -hmm. I were going to do uh, a Beatles cover album, I would be scared to change anything and I I would find it offensive if I did and it's funny that I was able to kind of do that with Nine Inch Nails songs and I'm very curious what Nine Inch Nails fans will think but I hope that the love is very evident and that the respect for the originals are very clear even when I do make those departures. Artists I know who've done cover albums or like high profile covers they there's two ways they go about it one is they avoid the original artist by at all costs uh, just wait organically for feedback. And then there's others who send it to the publisher of the artist, the manager, and go, hey, by the way, you could pitch this if you want. We're willing <laughs> to work with you. Which approach did you take with all this? Because notoriously, Trent is a little reserved and private unless he wants to deal with you. Yeah, I, at the time of this recording, have never uh, spoken to Trent or his people. Um, I would mm -hmm. like to. I would love to know what he thinks of <laughs> this project. But one of the things that um, my co-producer Adam and I said early on was that at least in the phase where we are making the album, um, it was important to think about them as little as possible. I, I really needed to, in some ways, kind of, um, I don't know, just decide that these were my songs at the phase of arranging them. And then, of course, I go back to, okay, this is Nine Inch Nails, put respect on the name and get so excited about Trent Reznor again but you know I needed to kind of forget about the originals and where they came from as I was putting them together and we do hear Adam sing on there we also hear uh was it Brian Spicer also does vocals on there yeah yeah we have male now man vocals. extraordinaire Brian Spicer <laughs> yeah yeah they both um they were both the producers of my first album um regrettably titled Cosby Sweater rest in peace yes. um and they both sang harmonies on my cover of Never Gonna Give You Up by Rick Astley and when deciding like I, I kind of really liked the idea of every single instrument on this album is going to be me. That felt like the Trent Reznor thing to do. But then when we in, invited the strings to come on and they did so much, I was like, you know, since we're already here, let's have a few little guest spots. Mark McConville is an amazing pedal steel yep. guitarist on Hurt. Um, Tim Rattouli plays incredible electric guitar on The Great Destroyer. And then Adam not only sings with Brian Spicer on Head Like a Hole, um, but plays the alto sax on Piggy and I think maybe Great Destroyer as well. There are two songs that he does uh, some alto sax. So it was really cool to get people to hop on the album um, and, and just make it that much cooler than I could have by myself. Is that the same Mark McConville that did the Super Ego podcast? Yes, he is a man of many talents. It's always so fun when someone who, like myself, is mostly known as being in the comedy space. Um, like I'm, I think a lot of people might be surprised that I even am a musician because most people know me either from Mad yeah. Magazine or TV writing or whatever. Um, and it's always fun when people have both of those worlds. And Adam's the same way. Like not everyone knows that the actor who is in so many things, including Buffy, <laughs> plays saxophone and sings and is producing a Nine Inch Nails cover album. 
Yes. Yeah, so back to what you just said about the different job titles. The first time I found out about you, you were kind of on a lot of comedy and Earwolf kind of podcasts, early 2010s. And we heard the Rick Astley cover. And then along the way, you go, oh, there's the Nerf Herder song. OK, she's <laughs> in the Weird Al thing. OK, Mad Max, <laughs> et cetera. So in other words, you have acting credits, you have writing credits. Uh, at, at midnight, you know, your name went out there about that. What are you at this point? When, when <laughs> somebody, well, are you a writer, producer, social media person, musician? Do you have a name for what you do? Uh, I guess you could say Renaissance man. I'm just, I just am a creative. I really have never felt um, like one title really is a good catch all unless you just do kind of jack of all trades. But um, yeah, that's probably one of the reasons I've never had uh, any representation. <laughs> I don't know exactly what lane it is that I'm doing really? other than I, I just want to work at the places that make me happy and align with what I do, even if that maybe isn't the most like easily marketable thing. Um, and the through line of every job I've ever had is that um, it's something I'm passionate about. And that's, that's the way that I like to do it. It would be amazing if um, it all, you know, makes me uh, tremendously wealthy. We'll see if that happens one day. <laughs> and with all the job titles that I mentioned, I didn't call out the Simpsons podcast, which keeps growing and growing with better guests and all that. So, you're at this point where you do a lot of different things that are high profile, but not everyone connects the dots. But is this kind of where you wanted to be all along and you worked up to, or is it an accident that you're here? <laughs> well, when you say here, what is what is the destination we're at? The Nine Inch Nails album or this podcast or just my life in general? <laughs> I, was, I was meaning pro your professional life in in general, because if you think back to the olden days, uh, I'm presuming you're a little younger than me, but if you grew up watching The Tonight Show and Conan and all those kinds of things, when you'd see a comedian do their five minutes on there, they were just a comedian. Like maybe they got one or two film roles, but that was that. And when you saw an author, an author was just an author, et cetera. Yeah. And it, I get the vibe that it was kind of thing where you just said yes to a bunch of things and here you are. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, maybe that's my ADHD showing up, <laughs> but I I don't know that I could be satisfied doing just one thing. I also don't know how sustainable it is in this day and age, at least, to to only do one thing if it's not going to be your main source of income. It's it's pretty difficult to be a musician only unless you really, really have the team or just are so unbelievably talented and all the stars align there's a lot that makes it difficult to just be a musician or just be a stand-up or whatever the thing is and um yeah if you could find a way to balance like your day job is also the thing that you love and you're also doing creative projects on top of that you end up having a life like mine where you know my day job at the time was like mad magazine but i'm also making like a concept album about a TV show I like and and doing a, writing a Simpsons book and stuff like that um because yeah my my hobbies uh also are my career so it, it's just that I have a lot of hobbies and <laughs> they kind of are spanning genres there so going back to the Nine Inch Nails album you said that it took about two years to do the Kickstarter people were in the loop about that to us it's a new album because it's not out yet to you, it's an old album in a way that you're going to have to keep talking about for months to come because, hey, the press days are coming and all that kind of thing. But are you already thinking about the next album? Um, well, first I'll say, like, it's still a new album to me because there have been so many additions and last minute songs and choices down to the oh. wire. Um, we end the album with the song Wish, which initially mm -hmm. was planned on being the very first track. And then when that did not end up working out, I cut it from the album with Adam. We said, we don't miss it. We don't need it. And then we found, actually, this mix that we got from John Griffin sounds so great. It not only needs to be on the album, it needs to finish the album. And so there's been something new, whether it was the mastering from Katie Tavini or just like, you know, we're about to have it pressed on vinyl. Like there's something that's going to be new and exciting every step of the way. And because it's a two year long project, it really is something I I'm so excited to talk about, especially since making music is an extremely isolating experience. And most of the two years was spent 
alone in my bedroom um, making these recordings and it's pretty heavy source material. So it's not exactly like <laughs> always happy and enjoyable to work on. So I'm just very excited that I get to start talking about it. But to answer your other question, um, the next cover album that I'm going to do, um, I will of course continue to do original music you mm -hmm. know, sporadically and hopefully an original album down the line. But the next uh, cover album will be called uh, They Might Be Gertz. Oh, uh, I... I think you could probably guess uh, <laughs> the source material on that. Yeah, you you have a sound man uh, from <laughs> that band on yep. your album and you have a former opening act of him uh, of them producing your album mm -hmm. with you. Yeah, so I'm I'm excited about that one. I think that could be fun. I've already done a little um just a, a couple of demos, but I my Dr. Worm cover is one that I'm very oh. excited about. And uh, that's that's my favorite. So that that should be a fun one. Uh, what are the odds that Weird Al might be on that album? Because uh, I've heard from, from as somebody who used to work on They Might Be Giants' management team, I've heard a story or two about Al wanting to come backstage at Giants shows. <laughs> well, that's a great uh, that's a great pairing in my head. Let's see what Al thinks of it. Um, I was very excited that um you know, he he publicly on Twitter and different platforms has very graciously referred to me as a friend. He'll say like, my friend Allie Gertz is the, the new um, editor at Mad Magazine. It always makes me be like, you're crazy. Like he sends like a little holiday card to people and I get to be a recipient. I always think it's again, like some kind of weird, like practical joke or something. Cause how do I get to know Weird Al? Um, that said, I approach every time that we talk as though like I'm kind of meeting him for the first time but he's so friendly and so nice and I was very delighted when he asked me specifically like how is the Nine Inch Nails album going I'm like that's so cool that you know um but apparently he's been listening to a lot of Nine Inch Nails and that's very exciting too because you don't really think of those but he did a cover of kind yes. of like um yeah <laughs> closer in the polka medley yes <laughs> exactly so that's very fun but yeah, let's let's see what uh, let's see if we could try and get Al excited about my Weird Alley version of uh, They Might Be Giants. Weird Alley. <laughs> <laughs> I never made that connection right there. Well, two quick questions and then I let you go. And the, the first one is, have I left out any projects? Because I've already talked about 10 to 15 different projects <laughs> I've been involved with. And for all I know, you're like, hey, why didn't you talk about blank? That's my main focus, because in a good way, you're very hard to keep up with. <laughs> Thanks. No, the last two years has really just been about this album. Um, everything else has just been, you know, kind of more of the same. So this is the new project. This is what I'm excited to talk about. And you covered it all. Thank you. And the last question, what's the last concert that you went to for fun? Not because you were researching something or going to cover that artist. Well, <laughs> I didn't know that I was going to cover this artist, but they might be giants. Um, I went to uh, a show last minute. Spotify has like a little announcement if you're listening to a band that says, actually, these guys are in town. I'm like, what? Right. And so they were in San Diego. They were also going to be at the Hollywood Bowl, but I prefer I prefer not the bowl when I can have the chance to not go to the bowl just because the sound is better at a lot of different places. And so I went to this. It was my second time seeing them live. I've only seen them twice. And I just was like, well, there we go. Now I have to do a little cover album of this, too, because they rule. It's just so fun. Outrocast.